Okay. We're doing today the, some of the details of the expansions. The, the, the generalization of Fourier analysis, the, um, the, is group theory, really, group theory for physicists. And um, as I've already mentioned, the group theory for physicists hasn't always been popular with the uh, uh, many of the great physicists, Schrodinger, well, the group and pest, Feynman, my own advisor, uh, ridiculed some parts of it. Uh, I wish I had had what I'm going to show you today uh, when I was arguing. So um, the basic idea of using these two groups we talked about last time, uh, local and global, is the main topic today. But we're also going to review uh, the algebra and show uh, some of the little algebraic tricks that make life easier. That's the other thing about group theory is it, it didn't always make it easy for people. If you understand what we're doing today, things get a lot easier and you also get more power. You can do things that we're going to show later like quantum rotors and stuff like that, essentially uh, almost for free. Whereas to do it any other way is very painful and so painful that I don't know very many people that do it. So, and nobody in this department except us uh, uh, knows these little secrets. So, th this is a big secret uh, right here still. And uh, I'm going to build it up uh, just on the algebra that we've done already. So, remember we had uh, three stages. Uh, the first stage was to look at the center of the group. That's the set of all objects that commute with everything in the group, including their projectors. Uh, the three projectors for our group that we're working with is an example, D3. Uh, there were three in number. <clears throat> and then the characters, which are traces, we're going to go over that uh, again. And then the second stage is where you uh, take some of one or more of the projectors <clears throat> that you got out of the center and split it into make more projectors. So this small set of projectors that commute with everything, all commuting, I call them, then uh, make a, a larger set of ones that are not all commuting, but they're mutually commuting. So this is very important to somebody who's doing quantum mechanics. You're trying to find the maximal set of operators that you can simultaneously obtain eigenvalues and eigensolutions uh, for. And then finally, in order to manage these, the third stage is to make a, a collection of basically non-commuting. Some of them are non-commuting. Some of them are uh, still from these other sets. So that forms the whole algebra uh, of that uh, we're going to be using to do calculations in symmetric systems. The so-called simple matrix algebra, the multiplication rules for our uh, big set of six for D3 non-commuting projectors is uh, this uh, right here. And we need to ha see how that does transformations right and left, uh, how you expand um, first uh, the group operator in terms of those things, but then reverse. And uh, yeah, I've got lots of examples uh, with this particular uh, group D3 table or diagram uh, that we'll use throughout. <coughs> and then we'll do this business with the local versus global, the, called the mach uh relativity duality uh, principles. And then we'll uh, apply show you uh, how you can manage some pretty complicated numbers. Even uh, <clears throat> this group D3 provides uh, some very very subtle things that I just touched on in the uh, previous lecture. So let's start off with review stage one. In the center, <clears throat> we have a set of classes, and we're trying to uh, obtain the projection operators that are linear combinations of those class sums. Uh, just to remind you, <coughs> the uh, coefficients uh, that do this transformation are carry a g g class uh, order, uh, an integer, uh, a, a dimension, um, 
that that is the uh, dimension of what's going to be an irreducible representation. The uh, characters themselves are the traces of those matrices that we're looking for uh, in the third stage. Um, different notations for the character, chi, mu, parentheses, group element, or subscript, uh, indicating the class or, uh, of that group. And these traces are invariant to similarity transformation, so everything, every element of a class will have the same number uh, in its trace. And here are the class sums expressed in terms of the uh, projection operator. So the first class is just one by itself, and it's a completeness relation summing over the three um, all commuting uh, projectors. Then this uh, operator here has a different set of eigenvalues, 2, 2, and minus 1, using those same uh, projection operators in its spectral decomposition. And finally, the sum of the 180 degree rotations, the I1, the I2, and the I3, there were three of those, uh, it's this particular sum here, 3, minus 3, and 0 are the eigenvalues for these um, representations that, using standard notation for this group, uh, most common standard notation, A1, A2, that's symmetric, anti-symmetric, and then parasymmetric is probably a a good as name as I can come up for the E's. But you will, uh, in all of the uh, applications to molecules, atoms, and solids, most of the literature uses this notation. And when you see an E, just think of a doublet. <laughs> um, that's what it will represent. It will represent a two-dimensional representation. And I'm indicating uh, a projector that can be split uh, at this uh, next level at the stage two uh, with sort of a ghostly symbol here. Now I've, I, I've seen, seen here on the screen something I don't see on my computer and that's an extra little box around to get excuse. Please excuse that. I haven't figured out how to get rid of that yet. But in any case, uh, this is the table of characters that we got in lecture 15 right around page 24. And the coefficients that I've uh, put here um, are, are the uh, are, are um, in, in this case uh, well in fact they're they're integers in um, all of the groups that we'll be seeing for a while here. What I would like you to notice is the order of the class. The order of the class unit is one. The order of the class R, which is the second class here, consists of two operators, 120 degrees uh, right-handed. 120 degrees left-handed, and then finally there are the three 180 degree rotations for the third class. Uh, those numbers appear right here, and, and the idea is that the character of the, of the scalar symmetric representation, the one whose value is always just a single one, it's never degenerate, and uh, that is a, a way to get these coefficients right off the bat without calculating anything. They're just the order of the classes. Similar shortcut that you should know about um, goes when you invert uh, this equation to, uh, to write the uh, projectors, or we had a way of getting the projectors directly from their roots. Do you remember that? Uh, if you remember that, then this is, these are the results here. And this has a nice formula. It's, in general, it's going to be uh, the dimension uh, of the uh, representation in question, in this case, two. Uh, that squared divided by the order of the group is the coefficient uh, of the uh, unit class. So each of these uh, are, are obeying that. So when you're doing a, an initial calculation of a group that you have no idea uh, what you're going to get, uh, little shortcuts like that uh, can help you check yourself uh, as you do those uh, spectral decompositions. Uh, so for these D3 examples, it's showing that. Uh, rather clearly. Now, second stage. After you've gotten uh, these uh, hollow um, uh, outline font uh, projectors, the ones that commute uh, with everything, the all commuting uh, projectors, after you've gotten those uh, using the class algebra, the next step is to split them into as many irreducible projectors as, as is possible. By that I mean as many projectors 
that you can find and will split no further. Splitting and reducing, uh, those are two terms that refer to uh, what happens to projectors, but each projector represents some set of levels and if it represents more than one set of, uh, if it's a doublet, it can split. So that's really what physics are interested in, is the splitting of levels. But uh, here it's a splitting of projectors into sums of, call them smaller projectors if you, if you like. But th that's basically Sorry. the idea. Sorry, how, how can we find them? How can you find how the... the yes, the splitter. Well, first, it's a good idea to know how many. How many, yeah. Right? And the how many is found in the first column of the character table. In other words, I can be guaranteed if that's my character table that this one will not split, there's only one. This one will not split, there's only one. This one will split in two. So that's a very important thing to do is to look first at that number, the L alpha. L super alpha in parentheses uh, is the dimension of the irreducible representation characterized by, or labeled by that uh, E there. So that's the first step is to find that number, how many um, uh, things can uh, a particular, uh, shall we call them symmetry species, that's the name that's given by uh, people that uh, work in higher energy, high energy physics. Uh, the dimension of that is, is very important. Uh, first step. Um, then the step is to actually split into that many uh, things. So um, <clears throat> uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. Now I want to uh, make a point here that we made before. And the sum of all of those uh, L's, in this case 1 plus 1 plus 2, that's 4, is the rank of the group in question. So knowing the rank uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, another key uh, to making progress through stage two and stage three of the uh, splitting uh, uh, of this. So the uh, idea is that each of these that can split, that is, each of these for which L alpha is greater than one, they're more than a singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, something, okay? Well, that splitting is, and I emphasize, not unique, whereas all of the stuff that's going on in the center is unique. You can make a table of these characters and all of the other numbers that go with the characters, like the order of the group, the order of the class, and of course the dimension is the character of the unit uh, uh, <coughs> element for any of these uh, representations. Those numbers uh, are, uh, shall we say, golden. They can be stamped in a gold tablet. They can be printed. No one will uh, ever get a different answer uh, for those. And so you find them tabulated uh, in any book on symmetry. But the next stage here, that's where I said that things start to get loose-ended and flappy. Uh, this splitting that we're about to do is not unique. It depends on a lot of things, and, it, it, and every different way of doing it is a, is a different kind of physics. Sometimes very, very uh, similar physics, but sometimes very different. But I'll show you two archetypes. That's what we did last time, the standing waves and the moving waves. This leads to standing waves if I decide to use these um, spectral decomposition of C2 subgroup that consists of that just a, the I3 that goes through the x-axis. If I'm going to decide that I want that diagonal, I want the eigenvalues of that to be part of my uh, story today, then I am going to use its projectors who sum to one, that's the completeness relations for the C2 projectors you remember. Okay, so that just forget that, sum those up and you get one, because this cancels that, symmetric and anti-symmetric, right? Uh, so uh, the, each of these projectors, if multiplied by this thing, will give us a new 
reduced project, uh, projector uh, it, in this case. This, th these two will be non-zero. Whereas if I apply uh, this projector or this projector to uh, my uh, PA1, well, this one will give zero and that one will give just PA1 back again. And then uh, PA2, well, that would be zeroed by this, but it would go fine with this and be compatible with that and it would just give it back again. So uh, these things don't do anything to the uh, projectors that are in the center and have L, L, uh, mu equal to one. They don't split, so we're done for them. It's the ones that can split that we have all of the really interesting physics to, to go with. So uh, we uh, have already given a couple of different notations uh, to this. It's a double index notation and we'll remind you of why that is in a minute here. Uh, here I'm doing our old notation for C2, um, 0 mod 2 and um, I'm seeing here that I've made a typographical error as there are series. Uh, this is 1 mod 2 right here. This is symmetric and anti-symmetric. X and Y uh, are the um, uh, two uh, uh, different kinds of uh, states that uh, come out of uh, this particular E uh, per, um, projective item potent that uh, was once in the center, but now it's split into things that are not all commuting. They're mutually commuting, so we can diagonalize uh, anything associated with them. And the A1 and the A2 are also in that. So that's our rank four uh, that for this group. Uh, accounted for, we don't have to do any more splitting, we just have to do uh, the details of the splitting. And the OR here stands for another way to split. So here's the situation for uh, actually working out uh, what those projectors look like. And basically I'm going to do 1 plus I3 and 1 minus I3 over 2 times the projector uh, for uh, PE. This is, if you recall, PE uh, is the uh, twice the class 1 minus the class of 120 degrees uh, plus nothing times the class of 180 degrees. So that comes out to, with group operators, this class right here is the 120 and then the minus 120, r to the first power, r to the second power, modulo 3. So. Uh, I just take this right here, twice that, minus that, minus that, times uh, this guy right here, if I put a plus sign there, okay, and then times this one if I put a minus sign here, so I can take care of both of these sort of at once here, and uh, that produces uh, the projectors that we're looking for. There's this one, okay, it's that, then uh, minus, uh, okay, if I have a plus sign there, it would be plus 2 minus I2 minus I1 because of these minus signs right here. So it helps you to use the group, you can just use the group table as a place on which to do the algebra of multiplication of uh, operators. Are we multiplying PE to 1 and I3? Yes, we're playing uh, PE, which is that thing. Multiplying. Okay, and it's getting multiplied by 1 plus I3, okay, o over 2, and I've put the 1 third that goes with this one right next to the uh, 2 that goes with this one to make a 1 6. It's just left outside. So I don't have to keep writing it over again. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So I get this and I get that. And then I check to see that if I sum these two up, I get that again. You know, that, that's what you always do with group theory. Make sure your completeness is, is, is being held. Uh, you split the thing and it better add back up to what it was uh, before it split, right? And that's pretty obvious. These things just cancel, leaving me with that, okay? And then I get a third, you see, uh, which is what I have to get. So group theory is very nice if you know how to work it you you don't end up going out on a long calculation and then it's wrong and you've got to go and scratch your head where did I go wrong because you have all these checks along the way you 
to say if you um, learn about the uh, lore of it. It's a symmetry manager is what it is. Now here's the other way you can go. Okay, this was done on page 84, but very quickly. Here we're uh, writing out a PE again. Okay, this little one third here, and we're going to uh, perform uh, that on uh, the C3 projector. Okay, where the uh, epsilon I didn't write that, but I put it on the uh, board here when I realized I hadn't written it. We're working with uh, three numbers, uh, one, the third roots of uh, unity, e epsilon equal 2 pi uh, i over 3, and epsilon star equal minus 2 pi i over 3. So uh, we'll have to do some complex arithmetic to finish this job, but it's easily done by geometry, uh, perhaps more than uh, by uh, going through it writing it in polar or rectilinear form and working all that out. But uh, th that's basically what's going on here. I'm just going to uh, uh, take this uh, right here and multiply it by that. And then I'm going to do it with, I'm just going to conjugate the answer. So I only need uh, one of these in this case to get the other one. So there's, there's the uh, two uh, <clears throat> and then minus uh, you look what you've got here. You've got a 1 here, and you got a 1 here, and a 1 here. So those are all being summed up. 2 minus epsilon minus epsilon star. That takes care of the coefficient of the unit operator. And then you go, and where are the coefficients of r to the first power? There's r to the first power right there. There's another one right there. And there's another one right there. So that's 2 epsilon star minus uh, 1 for this one and then minus epsilon for that one. And then finally, the last one is asking for the coefficients uh, summed of r squared. r squared is here, uh, here, and here. So that's giving us a 2 epsilon minus epsilon star uh, minus 1 uh, for r squared. <clears throat> now, a little bit of geometry of those numbers uh, lets us uh, you know, go actually work on them. Uh, if I factor out epsilon star, okay, uh, from this, uh, I'll get, well, I'll just check it, 2 epsilon star, then epsilon star times epsilon is 1, okay, it keeps its minus sign, and then epsilon star times epsilon star is epsilon, okay, and that's just the geometry of, and let's turn over here and just look at this, here's 1, there's epsilon, there's epsilon squared, which is equal to epsilon star. Now epsilon star uh, minus two would be this one, or uh, epsilon star going the other way, this much, and then going again uh, would be there. Epsilon times epsilon star just puts you back at one, okay? Now the thing we need are combinations of, and you can see that happening right here after I factor this out, 2 minus epsilon minus epsilon star. Okay, So I need a minus epsilon minus epsilon star, and I've got to add that to 2. So I just take these two vectors and put them over the 2. Now each of those things has a 60 degree angle, so this is a unit distance right here subtending a minus a half or a plus a half for this one and that's exactly what you're going to be asking to do. Two of those added to two gives you three. So uh, this particular number that sits here, here, and here is three and that's our answer. Okay, turns out it's the same as this. This projector just sees that projector says, come on in and doesn't change at all. And that's, you know, you, there are ways to see that that's going to happen, but when you don't see that, you just have to work it out. And then later on, I'll verify that it makes a lot of sense that it does doing that. Then the conjugate of this is that. So those are the, that's another way to split uh, this all commuting PE, uh, double degenerate item potent for D3. And it's the one that's going to project these beautiful circular polarized modes 
or circular sort of chiral wave functions uh, in the uh, various modes, tunneling modes of the quantum mechanical things uh, that we'll look at, uh, some of which is being uh, shown Sorry. on the screen Sorry. over there. Sorry. Is the epsilon is, is epsilon a constant? Epsilon uh, is a constant. Is one of the roots and, of uh, unity. This is the I guess the positive one. Direction R R. Those direction are R one R. They're zero. one. R. The, the radius is one. The radius is one, but the direction is in the direction of R, R1, R2, 1. Well, uh, there are eigenvalues of R to the first power and R to the second power, and that's an interesting that you should ask uh, that because the projection operator that we have here, um, actually come to think of it, uh, the way I have uh, set this up, I know that that actually epsilon there is minus uh, 2 pi, so uh, <laughs> this is epsilon down here, and this is epsilon star up here. I'm going to change anything, but uh, that that is, I'll, I'll tell you later how I know this. The rotation around the R1, for example, yeah? I'm yeah, right. right. The, the, the rotation uh, on R1, if I were to do it to this as a state, you see, would, move, would cycle me uh, one step uh, up to r squared, and if I did it uh, uh, to to, the, to this one, I'd get back to here, and and, and mm -hmm. then finally a third would just put me back where I started, right? So these are the three phases. Remember when we talked about the uh, triple oscillator, right? They were the three phases that went do 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 like that, just perfectly two pi over three out of phase with e their neighbors, either positively or negatively, depending on whether it was uh, a wave going this way or a wave going uh, the other way. Okay? Was that, you recall that? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, th so these, these is a much more subtle um, way to split the item potents. Not one that most people <laughs> stay away from. You've opened a book and they'll be doing something like this and not touching that. The root epsilon for this problem, since we're doing D3, relates to the C3 part of the D3. When we do D4... Then it'll be 2 pi i over 4. 4. Yeah. And it'll look like a cross. Yeah. That's right. Coming up. And that, that will be a homework. So you, you'll, you'll be uh, talking about plus and minus i <laughs> and 1 and minus 1. You know, it's actually a much easier problem than this one because you don't have to do this kind of thinking in geometry with that one. It's very rectilinear, very dec very Cartesian. But then just to make things nasty, I may give you D5. Give a little rational. And it's got golden ratios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, and that goes back to your heritage. <laughs> they worried very much about the Greeks discoveries in geometry and how they could algebraize uh, them. So uh, there's a great history uh, associated with these symmetries. All right, uh, does that make sense, uh, more or less? Um, we're now at uh, stage two and we've got a uh, complete set of mutually commuting projectors of some kind. And there are virtually an infinity of different possibilities. I don't have to pick I3, I can pick I1 or I2, or any linear combination of I1 and I2 if I really want to be crazy. Uh, those are all interesting things for later on. Here's stage three, the, uh, what I, some people call the Peter Vial. Peter's name, I don't know if it's, I don't know much about, but he did, but Herman Vial is certainly uh, very much a, a progenitor of physics group theory. So um, I'll mention his name um, in the in the uh, this that comes from here. So we're going to do uh, 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 now an expansion of each group element, of which there are six, and we're going to come up with six projectors of some kind. Uh, and these these uh, uh, this set is a non-commuting set, and it has to be because this group is non-commuting. I cannot expect a non-commuting group, a non-abelian group, to 
uh, can be completely diagonal so, so all of this technology that we're developing here is to take care of of the fact that it's non-commuting. Now uh, the projection uh, multiplication table is something we're going to make a big fuss about. Uh, it has a very deceiving name of simple matrix algebra and that, that's a good name because it's basically setting us up to understand matrix algebra or particularly the complicated matrix algebra that we're uh, developing here uh, for the E representation in particular. Uh, it does need a two by two matrix uh, to uh, generate everything that's going on here. So uh, we need to talk about, uh, first of all, the expansion. I'm just going to show you a page of what we were doing with uh, stage one and two and uh, point out uh, the simple matrix algebra. And then we'll do transformations uh, with them in various uh, ways uh, to make some sense out of it. So, what we're looking for, as I said in stage three, is an expansion of G in terms of the projectors. Well, we already showed a picture of this, and I'm just going to show the picture again from uh, preceding uh, lectures. This is back in the last lecture around page 90, um, actually 90 to 97. We took this in stages. I'm just giving it sort of all at once almost here. Um, the basic idea is that you start by taking the one, which is a sum of the four rank four projectors, two of which are just ordinary things that can't split, and then these two came from a splitting of the E uh, projector uh, into X and Y's, with two, in this, two index notation, which I uh, will show you is really uh, a, a good thing to have. Uh, you wouldn't think, most people wouldn't put it uh, indices on these because they didn't split. They would only put them, Figner would only put them on the E representation. That's a mistake. That, uh, the, this, the, to do the physics uh, elegantly, you need to know uh, about the uh, quantum numbers or the quantum symmetries associated uh, with all of the projectors. So uh, here we go with uh, four times this thing, times four more things. So uh, if this were to all play out with numbers, there would be 16 things I'd be writing down here. But I, I don't get 16. Uh, I only get one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's all I can stand to get, because I only have six different group uh, operators here. Don't have them. This group is not of order 16. This algebra is not of order 16. It's just has an order of six. So uh, most of the, this has disappeared, you see. We've lost 10 numbers to, uh, out of the 16 to give us uh, this. And these two right here are just right on the diagonal. And there, this is not any different from the situation we had with the group uh, C6, for example, or C4, or C3, any of the cyclic groups, uh, the projections uh, all commuted with the thing, so they would come through and kill each other and just leave you with a group operator times the projection, which would be a number times that projector. And uh, that would be a combination then of projectors for each of the group elements. Here we get two extra things, and they are not idempotents. These are going to be proportional idempotents. These are what we call nilpotents, because if you multiply them by themselves, you get nothing. You get zero whereas the idempotents multiplied by themselves give you back uh, the idempotents. So the idea is to set this up as a linear combination of six numbers called the irreducible representation D and the, projector, the projectors, uh, two of which we know and two which we don't know, uh, uh, haven't s uh, studied very well. But that's the idea. I'm going to have a uh, number here, a number here, these can just be plus one all the time. This is plus one or plus minus one, depending on whether G is odd or even. And then this, this, and this, and this are components of a two by two matrix, which we need to derive uh, in some way or other. And there are many, many, many ways uh, go, to go at that uh, question. That is the bottom line of physics group theory and mathematical group theory too getting the 
uh, representations uh, that come with a particular choice that we've made here to split. So we've already seen this back on page 97 or so, uh, and now the question is how do we how do we visualize this? Um, how do we think about this? How do we uh, deal with these weird uh, operators, some of which are idempotent and some of which are, are nilpotent? So that's the thing I, I, I would like to just sort of lay out all at once. So just to once again, here's G um, multiplied by 1 on both sides, giving us a, uh, irreducible class item potents with, uh, for which most people that uh, you would talk to would say, I don't need uh, to put subscripts uh, under these, but I say, you should. You definitely need to put them uh, with the, those guys, okay? Now there's some previous notation that we used, 1 mod uh, 2, 0 mod 2, and here I've got the ones in the right places. Uh, the one refers to y-axis, which is perpendicular to the x-axis, and is anti-symmetric to the uh, uh, operation I3, uh, which we're taking to be the main, the, the splitting scheme uh, that's making all of the numbers that you see. Uh, and here are the irreducible representations that we want. I'm just giving them to you right now, and the idea is to figure out ways. How would we deduce those if you didn't know them, if you didn't even have any physical idea what this group meant, and that's the situation we may uh, encounter in physics at certain points. Okay, so besides the idempotent projectors, of which there are four, that's the rank of the group, there are two more nilpotent projectors, and here they are. And the multiplication rules for these things is almost as simple as it was for the abelian projectors. Remember, the projectors that commuted with each other, uh, that was true for any cyclic group, right? You had three projectors for C3, four projectors for C4, all commuted with each other and satisfied the uh, equations that PI, PJ was zero if I was not equal to J, but if they were equal, then it was just PI equal to PJ, okay? And this is a little more complicated because these things have hiding in them projectors like this. That is to say, this projector right here was made by putting a PJ uh, from our center on one side and the uh, PK uh, also from that set on the other side. So they sort of have little bodyguards that are hiding inside them. Uh, the PJ bodyguard on this side and the PK bodyguard on that side. And this guy here has a, a PM bodyguard uh, facing the PK uh, bodyguard of the left-hand factor. If K is equal to M, then fine. Uh, they'll go and say, shake hands and uh, everything will be fun. okay. And we can continue and make a projector that has the two outside indices, J, N. If they're not equal, if they're from a different tribe, uh, they will come and they will shoot each other and they'll be dead. I'll get zero uh, if they're not of the same tribe and these will just be zero. This product will just be zero. So that's that particular little uh, thing. Now, the further, furthermore, they also have to be of the same race. <laughs> or I don't know what they do. They chop each other up or whatever. They get zero. So these are two ways to get zero from this product. Okay? They will die. But if K is equal to M and mu is equal to N, that means uh, I don't have an E here and an A1 here. That would kill it. But if I have an E here and an E here, oh, okay, I can get an E here and I will get JN. Uh, for the values of its uh, sub-indices. So th this is really a key piece of uh, ring theory, um, algebra, I mean higher algebra, um, Lie algebra too, they, they can be uh, related to this. Uh, you have relations uh, like this for, with commutators, but we won't go into that right now. 
But anyway, here is the multiplication table for these P's. Now you see, what we're going to do is we're going to take this group and we're going to write it as a linear combination, you see, of these projection operators, particularly these right here are the uh, hard ones to understand. Uh, these are just like the abelian world, this Fourier analysis up to this point. This is something new, okay? So each of these um, uh, P's that we're going to make um, m must satisfy a very simple uh, out generalization of the uh, projector orthogonality. This is the super projector orthogonality. And here is the complete table for D3. The first part of it is just like we had before. Okay, all diagonal. But this one is block diagonal. And you see what I've got here. I've got P sub XX times P sub XX. Oh, well that just gives P XX. So that's not too different. The diagonal terms are not too different uh, from what we had here. Certainly that one is very similar. And at the very bottom here I've got PYY times PYY gives me PYY. So those two are this one, this one, this one, and this one. Those are projections from the uh, uh, <coughs> split uh, rank uh, center of the uh, rank algebra in the center. But this one times this one, whoa, okay. Now I'm guaranteed, you see, that this one times this one or this one is not going to survive because of their, their different races. E is a different race in A1 and, and A2, okay. But um, the, the uh, the nationality, I should say, right here, uh, matches, okay? But it so also matches with this one. The one on the right here matches the one on the left here, you see. And all it does is give me x, y. The two outside things, the two inside shake hands and go away, leaving me with the outside x, y. Then I go here with this, this x on the right and hit here or here, I get nothing here and here. Okay? You see how the algebra works? Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. Yes. And you get here the I same that. thing I, that I you get know. here. Yeah. But in the first line, you say that... Uh, no, Starting first line. This. Those four can completely expand group by G. These guys? No, no. About exactly first, first oh, line. This is an equation for every element of this group, all six of them. Right? No. The first line. The first line. Yeah. Yes. Uh, why do we need the, the other two? Okay. Now we have four complete Remember expansion. what happened um, was this guy was irreducible. Yeah. So was this one. Yeah. And the third one, P super E, the one that I drew a hollow font, it was not irreducible. It could split in two. And, and that splitting was not unique, but we, we chose a operator I3 to do the job. I3 projectors split that into two times the unit element minus uh, R1 minus R squared uh, was, was being split into the uh, thing that we uh, showed before. Let's go back and make sure that you see that. Uh, that, that particular uh, splitting. This splitting right here of PE, okay, that's one that can split. Now, I pause for a minute and remind you in uh, this lecture we did show a picture of the representation of PE and we took the trace of it, right? And because we got four, we knew that the projector had to split. Actually, the, the um, sometimes you could do it in such a way that it just tell, gives you a number two. It tells you this thing's going to split in two. But the character table tells us this one's going to split in two. Right? The first column tells me this is going to split in two. It doesn't tell you how you're going to split because you haven't decided. you got to use some uh, piece of the algebra, either C3 or C2 or one of those uh, groups. Uh, to go ahead and get its projections operators out and make this thing and this thing. 
So Can that's take a crack at it? that's stage two. Okay. Um, I, yes, go ahead. I, it, I think the question might be why are those two? Um, there's a nail potent that's not being mm -hmm. utilized in our completeness. Well, it is there, mm -hmm. but in the final sum we don't see it. Now, perhaps um, that is a reason. We sure don't see it here. We don't see it here because we're still messing around with this with this, the center, well. right? We're trying to get an element outside of the center to help us make the rank. So far we've got only three, right? I need one of those guys to split in two so as to achieve the rank four. I believe the missing projectors that he's looking for will be used in the vibrational model. Well, um, the projector that you're looking for are, are actually right in front of of your face, okay? And they are projectors, but they're not item potent projectors. They're the cross guys, X, Y, or Y, X, okay, of the matrix algebra. That's the, the key to this, really, I think. Okay, now we've got six things, okay? It's just the two of them are weird. Right? Nil pole. Who wants to go out with a nil pole? Right? <laughs> well, it turns out they're the ones that really make things happen. Okay? So, uh, let's go back to that and uh, see what it is that this turns into. It turns into a linear combination of those two nil potents in addition to one, two, three, four item potents. Those are, those are very nice item potents. These are the weird guys. Okay? So how do we deal with them? How do we visualize their place in the whole scheme, you see? Uh, plus, how do you get their numbers, too? You want to get that uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, finally, you're going to end up with the numbers in this form. And that's really the rub. Is the reason Feynman and those guys hated group theory was because this is the way it was presented. All this structure is just those numbers, you see. What? That makes sense. We've got to make sense out of this. And here's where you start. You start to make sense out of it by re replacing the group multiplication table, which is you know, very geometrical. You can, you can see uh, how it works pretty, pretty easily. But um, this, this is, is cut and dry so to speak. I call these things the skeleton of the group. You take the meat off of the group and you're left with a skeleton that is the dimension six. And it has really simple multiplications. All the groups in the entire universe all obey this if you write them right. All of them. So th that's, in other words, this is a, uh, a uh, very dead sort of a multiplication table. It, it's, 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 as it says, it's simple. <laughs> okay? No complexity, right? It's except for here, where it acts like that matrix algebra. Okay? So, this is the, uh, you know, multiplication table, which is repeated down here. These are different than these. And so are these. I know you should notice something that I'm doing here, and that is I'm doing the same trick I did with the group table by putting uh, some elements, uh, say right here, and then putting their their uh, conjugates uh, here. Okay, so that I get item potents on the diagonal. So you'll notice that I have a y x here and I have an x y here. I have an xx here, but that's the same as an xx, okay? And then this one right here, that, that yx, here's xy. Okay, so th th this is a specially ordered table, but so is the group table in order to get the ones on the diagonal, right? And then this is just a copy of that. And if we have three dimensions, we have three copies of three by three matrices. We'll see that in the cubic groups, okay? 
So th this is a kind of structure uh, that is at the heart of all of the higher algebras. You're just trying to boil the thing down to its skeleton. And everyone's skeleton's the same. <laughs> the personality's gone. <laughs> and they, they have such uh, uh, quirky personalities, these groups. We're really happy we have a way to get rid of them sometimes. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, we want to talk about a little bit about the transformations that uh, occur uh, when you apply a group operator to one of these skeletons. What does it do? Well, expand the G in the skeletons. This is the expression uh, in general uh, that you're going to do. You're going to sum over all possible representations. We have an A1, an A2, and an E to sum over here. And then you're going to sum for each one of those. Say for E, you're going to have to do a X and a Y here and an X and a Y here. So you're going to be getting the XY uh, here, and you're going to be getting the XY uh, each one uh, summing there. All this is going to be multiplying this one right here, which is also made out of, well, whatever um, uh, projectors you have. You have six of them all together. Okay? And now we're going to use a simple matrix algebra to sort that out. Okay? First of all, uh, nothing's going to happen if they're from, um, <clears throat> I forget what I called it, uh, nationality or race, uh, let's call this race, okay? Different races, forget it, this is zero, go on to the next term in this sum, all right? But if they're the same race, then that's a one, and now we got to make sure that the bodyguard inside there, same nationality as the bodyguard M, N prime M, okay? So we're going to get N prime M uh, right there, okay? Well, that makes it uh, pretty simple. Here's what you get. You're just going to get a simple matrix sum, m prime m, the m coming from that, okay, and the n showing up on the right-hand side of the, of the existing tra trajectory, okay? That n showing up uh, on the right-hand side. It's got to match this n right here. Meanwhile, we do a sum here over m prime, okay? Another way to write this. If, if I can make a vector out of this thing and have it be orthonormal, and that's what we're going to do, we've got to normalize this uh, thing here, okay? And I'm going to put the notation inside the ket of the projector that made it out of one. Remember how we put group operators inside here, right? We're going to put whole projector uh, notation inside there uh, in, in order to do the quantum state analysis, okay? So this is a group operator times a particular MM state that's ending up to give me a sum over the transformation matrix coefficients over M prime. Okay? Now you might recognize this a little better. This is a simple irreducible representation expression. I call them irreps. Sometimes you just put off two R's, sometimes you use single R's. Uh, nobody does that, but we've got to shorten things up here. This is just telling me it's the matrix element M prime M of G for a particular N, and the N does not show up over here. So that's what an irreducible representation can be said to be. It's simply a matrix element of a transformation. Again, this is something that's kind of left out of every group theory book I know about. Uh, they don't go into that uh, very well. Anyway, let's go ahead and we're, we, we, we'll talk about the norm a little bit here because we need to make matrix elements of the P projector states. Okay, so I'm going to have a norm here, a norm star. I'm even letting the norm be com com complex. Uh, it is, I've never had to do that, but I think it relatively we will. Um, this uh, is the uh, uh, an actual projector here. And what we're going to find out they are orthonormal. That's because of this. That's your simple matrix algebra, right? They are orthonormal. If I pick the right value for this to make that into one. Okay? 
and then we'll see that this this actually comes true. Sure. I have a question. Yes. In that line, yes, we have G operating on that kit. What? Yes. Oh. I and the kit it. itself it. yes, is it's going it's to be a defined yeah. as a projector with those indices, yeah. right? Okay. And of course, the G is going on for the right. Okay. And then we hope that we can get these numbers, okay? And we will. Um, this is a little roundabout here, okay? Now, G can hit the other side, remember? That was the thing that was so cool about our spectral decompositions that we had left and right uh, eigenvectors for cyclic groups. Well, the, we have left and right transformation properties. And guess what that is? That's lab and body. That's uh, the duality between local and global that, that uh, is coming right here. It's just that it's sort of hidden. Okay? But uh, I'm going to put the G on this side, right? Blah, 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 blah. Okay? And it's pretty much the same idea, okay? Except that I would like to um, sort of jump ahead and make the statement, something we can uh, show later on when we have a fully complex projection. This works whether you're real or not. Uh, you do a dagger on PMN, you get PNM, no fancy business. You don't have to conjugate anything on the symbolic part. You do find up conjugating this thing, as you'll see. But in any case, the left multiplication looks like that. Okay? I'm just taking this equation right here and turning it around. Okay? So that's the conjugate expression uh, right there. Again, n is not showing uh, on the other side of the equation. And if it's unitary, uh, most of our quantum mechanical uh, stuff is this. But if it's quantum mechanics and relativity, you've got to go back to this one. So there are the two uh, left and right uh, matrix elements, if you will. Okay, now the expansion. How do we invert this relationship? Okay, that's, that's a an important thing. What are the coefficients of the G operator in P? We know the coefficients of the P operator is just D with the same quantum numbers, exactly the same position. No fun funny coefficients or anything. It's just bang. This is a, a generalization spectral decomposition of every group operator. But I want to know the projectors in terms of the group operators as a formula. So I need to derive these little p mu m n uh, coefficients. Okay, so that uh, is, uh, this is the best I can do for you. Is, uh, I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to do a left action on this projector. I know what that gives me, okay? Uh, right now it's just giving me f times g. These are just numbers, so this operator f goes through and uh, runs into the left side of the group uh, G that's being summed over, and that's a sum over 6 for our, our group here, over the group, okay? And then I go ahead and I say, uh, let me let uh, G equal F inverse H, or H equal F G, okay? I'll just you know, make a little substitution here to turn F G into a single element, okay? And then, of course, uh, I've got to still evaluate this coefficient, but I'm in a better position to do it now. And the reason for that is that the regular representation out of which all of this comes, which comes out of the group table, all of the regular representation matrices are traceless except for one, the unit. That has all the trace. Everyone else is missing the trace entirely. That's because we've set up this uh, multiplication table with the inverses of the elements that are here, uh, up here. Okay, we, that puts the one on the diagonal. Very important to be unitary-like in order to play these games. Okay, so now the trace of this thing right here is still a sum over h, but only that element that has a trace, namely one. Okay? <laughs> so
So the only coefficient that comes out of this sum is this one. F inverse times 1, which is F inverse. Okay? So when I apply an F to this thing, that's what I'm going to get. And this is, this trace is very easy. Order of the group. 6 in this case. Okay? Order of the group. Okay? Well, we're still not done, because all that's doing is giving me the coefficient I'm after in terms of 1 over the group times the trace of this. What is the trace of that? Okay? The regular representative trace is simply irreptive dimension L mu for the diagonal P mu M M or 0 otherwise. This is what the, uh, represent, the regular representation is going to look like when we get done with it by transforming to its P basis. And that's something we have to talk about because here's where all the beauty of these uh, uh, global and local uh, left and right multiplications, indices, and all that sort of stuff uh, really exposes itself. But one of the things that we can see is that the only thing that's going to contribute anything for me uh, on this trace are those for which m is equal to n. And for those, and let's take a peek at some of them, we've got uh, pxx giving us trace of 2. That's what we got for uh, the e's. Okay? This one would just give 1. This one would just give 1. But this guy is doubly degenerate, doubly splitting, so it's giving me uh, 2 every time it gives me anything. That will not give me anything. That will not give me anything. That will give me 2. Okay? So, it's P mu M's trace, and that's simply that. It's delta MN times the dimension of the particular projector. Okay? So, well, it looks like we're, we're on our way here, because uh, that's all we needed to know. Bring that around, and there's the coefficient for every group element. It's the inverse of the group element multiplied by the projector traced, but that's going to come out after we do a left action here to this thing right here, multiplying that, summing over m prime, which looks like that, okay? And now we really do know the regular representation trace. Trace is invariant to whether I've done this nice job on it or just I'm using the group operator uh, table uh, matrices uh, there, okay? So that's the thing that makes it work for us right there. Uh, we get a very simple expression. The coefficient of the group element is da da that. Okay? This particular one is just the inverse uh, that's put in there. That's pretty cool. Okay? So there's the, the vial expansion. That's the projection operator in terms of the group operators. If it's unitary, it's this. It's really easy to remember. PMN is DMN. But don't forget the star. If this is complex, that will screw everything. That is a major blunder that I see uh, very often in the literature as well as in homeworks. Okay, so there's the inverse of this. Notice that it's using the irreducible representation star. When we made our projectors with a cyclic group, we had uh, sitting there e to the minus ikx. The conjugate of that is e to the ikx, which is the wave function. So this is showing us that the d mu m m is the wave function for this system, whatever it is. That's what irreducible representation is really are if you're a statist. A statist in quantum mechanics is someone 
who believes that the states have reality. I doubt that. To me, everything in quantum mechanics is, is something happening. There is no state. States are artificial. And if you really do have a stationary state, you can't look at it. You can't even know about it. <laughs> but we'll play the game. This is the wave function for that state. And we're going to have a lot of fun with this on some other uh, problems. But the one that we're doing right now is already pretty fun. Okay. Now, um, I want to very quickly go through this because it's something you should really do yourself. And uh, it's fairly easy to do, but I just want to give you an example of a D3 transformation with a full 6x6, six six, which yields these numbers if you do it right. And I'm not going to uh, do it completely right here. Uh, I won't show you the, the, the complete tricks of the thing, but the basic idea is this. I'm going to multiply by 120 degree rotation a P11, okay? and. Uh, we had already a formula for that, but we're going to just go ahead and do it. So what do you do? You take R1, and here's P11. P11 is this thing right here that we worked out. That was our first split off uh, using the I3 operator. Uh, and I think that's right. We had a 2 here, and a minus 1, and a minus 1, and a minus 1, and a minus 1, and then a 2 there before I, I trimmed it down uh, a little bit by that factor uh, L L mu over OG that we just calculated. That's our norm, okay? So we're checking to see if that, in fact, is a normalized state, and it is, okay? So uh, what you've done with the R1 is you multiply this guy, and got an R1 here, right? You multiply this guy, got an R squared here. Multiply this thing, got an R cubed, which is one here. Then, you know, using this little table or that one, uh, you can find out what R1 times I1 and I2 and I3 are. There they are. And then you just reorder it. Just put them in the order that they were, but take the numbers with it. Okay? That's what the transformation uh, of this thing uh, is. It turns this vector here into that vector. Okay? Now the idea is that this transformation should be um, some coefficient d11 uh, times this thing plus d12 times this thing. And then if I do it with a second uh, state, let's say 2, 1, okay, there's that. That turns out to be this. As I say, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Okay? So, the idea is that this transformation of this particular vector should be a linear combination of this one plus this one with irreducible representation coefficients. Okay? So what you can do is you can do a scalar product of this right here with that, which is that, okay, and get this number right here. And then you can do the same thing with a scalar product that looks like this to get the other number. So we get minus a half and square root of 3 over 2 for the overlap with the states that we would have started with, which is this one, and the uh, vector that went with this one right there, 2, 1, that vector. Okay? So there's your answer. That's your transformation using these coefficients, 1, 1, and 2, 1. So this really exposes what a transformation uh, of an E doublet looks like when you do a, uh, one of the six group operations. In this case, it's the 120 degree rotation. And that's what it looks like when you picture it. Here is uh, this guy right here, okay? Here's the transform thing that came out, okay? You can see it just rotated all the activity over by 120 degrees, then this activity right here is a linear combination of minus one half times this plus the square root of three over two times the other one, this one. Okay? Okay, now this is something you, you should really do on your own so that you, you know, there's so many uh, steps 
that I uh, just want to skip now for lack of time. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead now and remind you this is what we're really after. Is we want this left and right stuff to feed into our global and, and local uh, thing and make some sense out of it. So as I asked before, how do you actually make R and R bar operators that satisfy such weird things? That is, these non-commuting things commute perfectly with every one of these non-commuting things. It's because they're independent. Okay, that's my mock mock first principle. Second principle is that if I apply this to one, I get the same thing uh, if I apply this, the inverse of that operator, uh, to one. Whatever the operator is, there's a doppelganger, a partner uh, in another group that commutes with it, but does the inverse to the one that this one does, and that's just because these red operators are moving the universe, whereas the universe here is in control. This is the only thing that we as uh, ordinary American physics uh, know. Uh, <laughs> we, we feel very comfortable in control here, right, not realizing uh, there's these things down here that could do something to us. That's being a little uh, prosaic, poetic, whatever. But in any case, the question really is, how do you uh, define those? Now, this is something else I'm going to go very quickly through because I want to show that the extrinsic global operations that are tied to the laboratory uh, do one thing while the other do the uh, inverse. Okay, so I just want to show that if I do an I2, okay, here, and there's the I2 axis right there, and remember it sits still and moves, whatever wave function there might be in these three wells, okay, suppose it was only this state, this little local state had some amplitude and everything else was zero, so we're just going to play with that one little peanut there, okay, and I do an I2 to it, I move the peanut out of that all and into this place right here. So that's the state I, um, I2 sitting. I mean, that's the way I would describe the state I2 is that the thing was lighting up in the I2 spot uh, of this uh, thing. And then if I come uh, do an I1 after I've done the I2, there's the I1 axis. And it, of course, is rock solid. That's what's so nice about laboratory view. You really feel like you're in control. Okay, And I'm going to go flip. I'm going to turn the peanut over to here, you see. And there's where it used to be. So it was started here, got sent there, and then got sent there by that operation. And that's all you would ever know if you didn't want to play the game backwards. We're going to play it backwards. We're going to let the little peanut move us. Okay? Now, just to check our group table, I1 times I2 equal R, nothing new there. Okay? That's an R, right? So that's laboratory stuff, okay? I want to do it backwards, okay? Body fixed, intrinsic local operations do some strange things, including improved them, it's here to move their axis relative to the lab. But the way they see it is not that at all. When I2 uh, axis, you see, and they, they're supposed to be lined up in the original state, so uh, the I2 bar operator is lined up right now with I2. It's not going to stay there. Um, well, this time it is, because the, the I2 is the one I'm going to do, and I2 doesn't change thing. But after I do an I2, I'm going to move the laboratory the opposite direction which is the same uh, direction because this is an invertible operator, okay? Uh, so all of the equipment, all the blue stuff is going to flip over, okay, uh, after I done. See the, after I2, look, it's upside down. Y is upside down. X is upside down. Little I1 that used to be uh, over here has been flipped over, right? And I3 gets flipped over to there, right? That's what the body does, or thinks it's doing, right? Body and his wave function have not moved. They've just moved the laboratory around it. Okay? Wave's still there. But the lab guy says, hey, wait a minute, you're not getting away with this. 
Okay, I'll let you have it, but I'm going to look at it my way. I'm going to look at it laboratory way. Okay? So I turn the whole thing back again, you see. And that's what I see as a lab. Now I've moved their axes, you see. Body fix and transient appear to the lab people move relative to the lab. Okay? So now they're upside down. And I'm back after a few in the laboratory frame. This is what that looks like. Okay? This weird? <laughs> you got to admit, this is weird. <laughs> but get used to it. <laughs> it's what's going to make uh, life easier for us. And then I go ahead and I do another one in I1. Okay? Now where's I1? I1's moved. I1's over here. Okay? So I'm going to turn I3 upside down. I'm going to turn X upside down. And I'm going to flip the I1 completely over to there. Okay? And so forth. But I'm not going to move my wave function. I'm the body, man. I, that, that thing's attached to me. It doesn't move. It only moves relative to the laboratory. Okay? Why should we do this a step two? Yes. You what, mean, what, how do we go from here no, to here? No. We, should, we didn't go from that to that. I think we, we, we went from the left one to the... The left one is this one. Yeah. Okay. And you mean that we went from the top? To That's the, the way we started. Everything, nothing has been done no. at all to that. We started from the above. Yeah. We did something, this, some rotation. This is, this is 180 rotation yeah. around the Y. Around the I lab, too. The lab. Yeah. The lab ro ro rotates. No, this is the body's axis in action. And it takes all of the stuff that's in the laboratory and moves it to that. Well, it moves it, 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 moves, it, it from moves here it, it, to that. Right? I2 takes X and puts it up here. Right? Mm -hmm. And after that, oh, it, oh I, I understood. Takes I got I, it. You see the I3 here? It gets sent down there. It. The I1 that used to be here gets sent there. And this piece of metal here gets sent to there. And after that, from the lab view, we and look then, at then, the... Then I go look around. At the, this is the lab view of this. Yeah. Okay. I thought that you came yeah. from the top to the... Yeah. Yeah. This is just a different view. Okay. And then I do one more, I1. Now, I'm just going to stop right now and go on because I'd like you to, uh, you know, uh, for, for, you know, see you that this is true and that this gets the same equation, you see. The, same, the group uh, product is exactly the same. Okay. If you're all red, you get the same product or as you do with all blue. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. But we knew that. That's, that's the mock thing. I have yeah. the same group table for moving this uh, 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 th from the inside as I do from moving this from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> and finally you get mock, mock, uh, exactly, if you turn it into a blue. So that's something I'll, I'll have you look at, okay? Now, here's where we start to make sense uh, of this. Uh, here's this group table for global. Here's the one that we did where we switch R with R dagger. This only thing we had to do. Of course, we had to do it on both sides, okay? This is a local group table, okay? Remember, we talked about how to make matrices that commit with each other. Okay, I just turned column G with column G dagger. If all of them were uh, more complicated, I'd have to do more work than this, but this is really pretty simple here. R and R squared, the only thing you can switch. Okay? Here is this multiplication table that I talked about. X, 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 Y, Y, X, Y, Y on this side, and then of course just like this one has the conjugates on this side, I'm going to have the conjugates here. Uh, pretty much the same uh, there, but then uh, right here y xy gets replaced with yx. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this yx here gets replaced with xy. Okay? 
And then this one right here, it should have Y on it, but uh, it's, it's uh, not uh, uh, changed. Okay? Now, if that's the uh, global, here's the local. I'm going to switch every one of these things that can switch. This doesn't switch, this doesn't switch, this doesn't. I'm going to turn those two guys around. That one doesn't switch. And I'm going to turn those two guys around. Okay? It changes the multiplication table. The, this multiplication table is different from that one. This one is different from that one. But they really are the same thing. PXX times PX gives PX. PXY times PYX gives me that. You see? But up here, YX would uh, be giving on PXX that, and PXY it would be giving that. Okay? Yes. All right? Okay. Now, how did this work before? This group table gave me a bunch of matrices that I call the uh, global uh, transformations. This table gives me a whole bunch of matrices corresponding to the local. And it was pretty marvelous when I first showed you that every one of these commutes with every one of those. How do you see that? It's really hard to see that. We need a way to see that. Okay, so we really must compare global versus global versus local, both for the G's and the P's. And then we need to look at it again just as a rearrangement, which is really what it is. Okay? So here's the global, okay? And here is what we want is the reduced form of the regular representation using the projection operators that are global. So at the position of xx, okay, I want to see a coefficient dxx, okay? And this is the expansion that we developed by the 1 times g times 1 equals g method, okay? Then here's xy, okay? xy, I got a 1 there, you see, okay? And I got another one down here, okay? There was also one for the other right there. And then, uh, what else do I have? Um, I have an xy here, okay? Like that guy right there. A yx here. There's yx. There are the two numbers that go with it. And finally, yy, two numbers there, right? So these are just placeholders for these numbers. They're like the unit, super unit vectors uh, for these numbers, these irreducible representation uh, coefficients matrix elements, okay? All right, that's global. Let's do it with uh, local, okay? Local looks like this. It's, it's put xx and xx in the same box, xy and xy in the same box, yx and yx, yy, they're all in the same box. Of course, these don't do anything in any of this, in this case because it's just abelian stuff. But this is the non commutative parts, okay? So, uh, xy, xy sitting over here. That's the co they're going to have the coefficient x, y on it, okay, etc. Well, so what? They're the two compared, okay? So what? This is what's really going on. What I've got in each of these cases is an A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, multiplying in a big A, big B, C, C, D, D, that th th this, this one right here, you see, it's like that, uh, and each of the uh, pieces of that thing uh, is like that, uh, this and this times this, this and this, commutes, okay? Th this is really marvelous, it commutes. This is where you can really see it. This thing is only seeing a unit matrix when it comes in there uh, to multiply. Then it sees another unit matrix when it comes to multiply. Same with this one and this one. Giving you exactly the same product as when this thing sees the unit matrix from the other side. It doesn't make any difference what side. You still get the same numbers. Now you start to visualize what's going on here. This is what makes this work. We're in the projector regime where it's easy to see. Do it in the group tree and you can't, you can't sort it out. But here you can sort it out.
Okay, we've got just a few minutes here, I think, and, and I'm going to rush through this um, very quickly. The idea is that we make states, this is being a statist, okay, and we have that norm, okay, we already know what that norm is, um, there it is, okay, so I've got matrix elements uh, with these two, three indices, one index to indicate, uh, shall we say, the um, uh, race, and then uh, the little indices, the, the nationality, okay, left action, already saw that, okay, same as we had before. Uh, left action here is under a different name. When I come with G bar here, I'm going to come with a G bar on a projection operator that's made out of G's. And G bar commutes with every single G. So G bar goes through the projection operator and runs into one. And you know what happens to a group element that hits a one? You can put an inverse on it and, and change it back to local, or change it from local to global, okay? So here's the mock mock principle at work, forget the normalization, okay? Now I've got a G inverse working on this side of the projection operator, it sees an N. This one is a projection operator that works on this side of the thing and sees M's. This is where the mock mock principle shows how it's going to go in quantum mechanics. G inverse P is this linear combination. I'm just using the, um, the uh, matrix algebra expansion, okay? Boils me down to that, boils me down to that, boils me down to that. If it's unitary, it boils me down to that. Meanwhile, this one boils down to that. So this is global matrix element component. It works entirely on the M's. The local matrix component works entirely off of the ends. And all it is is the same thing. It's M prime M. It's N prime N here, provided you start. You've got to start because it's time backwards too. This is CP theorem. But I won't get into that right now. That, that, this, this is really beautiful. Okay? So the blocker rearrangement that's occurring here. This is a P base ordering. I've got XX, YX, XY, YY. So this is one that would uh, flip and put my D's uh, there. That concentrates the global G, D matrices. Here's the other one where I flip those two. Okay. Now I've got the same numbers in every box here. Okay. Same numbers as here, but they're rearranged differently. Here the local G matrix is not com concentrated. Two more examples. Now I'm going to do the switcheroo. Put it back to XXXY, YXYY, which is what we started with, really. Okay. Now it's the global G matrix that's all spl splayed out. Whereas with this arrangement, the local one is on the diagonal. Okay. So that's just another statement of this relation right here. Uh, algebraic relations, so you can see it in the matrices. So the idea is one of these is going to be a Hamiltonian, the other one's going to be a transformation operator. Let's go ahead and do it. Here, as I say, is a Hamiltonian that's completely made out of linear combinations, R sub 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, but I'm doing a 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, just to like the group elements that uh, if you made them bold-faced, would be those symbols, okay? So I'm going to take this uh, H Hamiltonian and I'm going to figure out what it looks like in this basis. So I am going to take this matrix and diagonalize it as far as I could go without any further information. In other words, if I didn't know local versus global, I'd be stuck there. But because I do know local versus global, for certain localities, I can write an eigenvalue, eigenvector, closed form formula for you. That's what makes this powerful. So here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a Hamiltonian has a matrix element A and B, but they're internal. Those are internal. That's the structure of the subject. 
the M and N's is this global stuff uh, that you're doing in the laboratory. Okay? And we're going to do the usual thing of characterizing each kit by the quantum numbers mu, m, n, uh, wh wh whatever they mean. Okay? And we have some meaning for them here. With the, the, the nor usual normalization, but it will cancel out. It's just forget about it. You that's what's so cool about this. You don't need to worry about normalizations. Remember, that was one of the selling points of spectral decomposition in abelian cases. Here it's working that way too. So I'm going to use the projector conjugation to turn this uh, guy uh, around. Okay, So <clears throat> I come uh, here uh, with AM instead of MA when I come out on the bra side. Okay, that's one step that is easy to forget, and it'll make a mess right away, so you'll catch it. Okay, and then I'm going to do a uh, mock mock commutation because uh, the H is entirely made out of these things, so I can per commute the projector right through it and run into this projector, uh, and um, simple matrix al algebra will tell me right away that M and N have to be the same. Okay, delta M N. And then I've got to calculate that thing, P A B. You, here I'm using the orthonormality relations uh, once again and um, making a, a simplification. Okay, and then um, what I can do is just write out P A B with its norm square and everything. It will be canceled perfectly. No norms are left uh, in that relationship there. So this thing is going to give me a matrix element A B as a linear combination of these coefficients and the irreducible representations such as this one, and it's the, that's the one I want because it's the one that favors the I3. So here is the coefficient RG, okay, which is that matrix element right there, and it's one of those guys right there. And all the rows are the same, so I only have to do this one row. That's the whole idea of the symmetry. Okay? So here's the first eigenvalue. It's R times the sum of DA1. Just a sum of all of those. Here's the other one, A2. Surprise, surprise. It's the difference, okay, after the sum. Okay? Now RR is a real, so I didn't really need to put that conjugate on there, but do not forget the conjugates. That's uh, uh, where you can forget it, right, at the wrong time. Uh, and here's E1. Now it gets interesting. Okay? Well, I start pulling off the X, X components now. Okay? And then I pull off an XY component right here. Okay? Now it happens to be equal to the YX conjugated if this were, even if this were complex. Okay? And then I pull off the YY and I'm half done. The result of this is a two by two matrix, of which we have two that are identical. And that means the, this is a degenerate uh, uh, eigenvalue uh, that we're getting. Whatever I get from this, I of course get from this. So this is, I just write this once for all of the uh, partners. There might be three, or four, or five, six partners. I just do it once. Now it's off diagonal, isn't it? I could just solve this, you know, brute force. But here's where it really gets funny. If you have the local symmetry you thought you had when you set this up, then you know that R1 and R, R, R1 conjugate are equal to R2 and R2 conjugate, and that I1 and I2 and I1 is equal to I12, and then I3 is a free parameter. I'm left with just this. This goes to zero, that goes to zero. Those are my eigenvalues. Bingo. Closed form formula for this problem. Okay? I mean, it's so very efficient. The same, as I say, same damn projectures give eigenvalues, eigenvectors, dispersion functions, you name it. Just like in the Sickler case. Everything just falls right up. Really cool if you have a problem that's really hard. This is an easy problem. But still, it's giving you information that I pointed out before, here the Mach principle being applied to get you both the internal symmetry, 
that's this index, the red index, that's the local symmetry of the wave function in its little local town. Okay? Using these numbers, which are laid out right here, okay, that's giving you the wave as, as uh, of the state, of these eigenstates. Okay? There's what it looks like. It was a wave like we're going to show later. Uh, we'll have to do all this uh, later on. The next thing we're going to do is take on a vibration. I'm going really fast now because we are out of time. Uh, but we're going to take on a vibration and we're going to solve a, a spring, a horrible looking spring thing very easily. We're going to get another 2 by 2 matrix. It's very much like the one we have and with local symmetry it will become diagonal and look like that. Then we'll say, no, I'm going to do is, uh, a coupling. It's direct. Turns out that's the thing that we have to sum up. Now it's no longer diagonal. But then we say, oh, but you should have used uh, the uh, sym symmetry that made a, a combination like that. Those are the modes. And now the eigenvalues are zero for translation. This is global, uh, uh, favoring the laboratory with its empty space, so to speak and the intrinsic properties of the uh, spring constants on that. Okay? And finally, if you've got something that's uh, turning a magnetic field, you're going to get uh, waves like this. So this is what we have to talk about next time, which is tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>